The logistic regression model is probably one of the most widely used models for classification, and in many ways it's a simple extension of the linear model that we had been using earlier. So in the remainder of this notebook, I'll walk through the derivation of the logistic regression model and then the process of fitting it. The logistic regression model models the probability that a binary random variable y uh, takes on the value 1. Uh, so in, in the case of, of this data set, whether or not the, the tumor is malignant. Uh, and it does that conditioned on the feature variables x. And it takes a, a pretty basic form. So it models this probability that, that y is equal to 1 as 1 over 1 plus an exponential of a negative linear model. So here we have the, the basic linear model that we'd seen before, but now this nonlinear transformation. So as before, this is a parametric model. It is determined by the parameter vector theta. This part here is a linear combination of these features, but this is a nonlinear transformation. And so this is a form of what is called a generalized linear model in that it generalizes the basic linear model for a nonlinear prediction task. Now this function, 1 over 1 plus the exponent of a, a negative uh, linear combination or of a negative uh, t, um, is actually called the logistic function. So it takes the following form. So the logistic function is 1 over 1 plus the exponent of negative t. It's a logistic function of, of some uh, scalar t. Uh, it's often denoted as sigma of t, which is particularly confusing in a class where sigma also stands for a standard deviation. Um, it's, it's a sort of a virtue of the fact that this function sort of looks like an S in, or a sigmoid, and so sigma is, is the natural Greek letter for that, um, but it is also the natural Greek letter for something like standard deviation, um, and in weird cases also used for permutations. So with this notation, we could then write the logistic regression model as the logistic function of a linear model, and this again is where the term generalized linear model comes from. So to get an idea of what this sigmoid function or logistic function looks like, let's plot it. So here we've plotted the logistic function. And so here the x-axis is just a, a scalar t, and the y-axis is the value of a logistic function for different values of t. And you see it has this characteristic sigmoid curve where it starts out at, at 0, or very close to 0. And in fact, it never really approaches 0, only in the, in the limit does it get to 0. Um, so it starts at something very close to zero, and, and then as we get closer and closer to the origin where t is zero, we're going to be at, at about 0.5, or exactly 0.5 when, when t equals zero, and then it's going to symmetrically converge towards one as we get to larger values of t. So the logistic function is mapping the real numbers to the interval between zero and one. This allows us to transform the output of a linear model into something that we can treat as a probability. To get a better understanding of the logistic regression model, I want to work through a simple one uh, feature dimension example uh, where we're using a linear model. Uh, the linear component of this model it has just two parameters, a theta 0, which is corresponding to our original uh, uh, constant or intercept term, and a theta 1, which is our original slope term in the linear model. And remember, we're still passing this to the nonlinear logistic or sigmoid function. So I want to plot what happens when I vary the values of theta 0 and theta 1 to get an understanding of how we transform a linear model into something that encodes a probability. So I've plotted a number of different values for the theta 0 and theta 1, and each value of the theta 0 and theta 1 is a different line on this plot. The x-axis is the input to this logistic regression model here, so this is just the x on the x-axis, and the y-axis is the probability that y equals 1 given x for different parameterizations of our model. So the first thing to notice is that uh, we can flip this, this curve. So here's the, the sigmoid going in the positive direction. So that is the, the negative values of x correspond to prob low probabilities, and, and the uh, positive values of x correspond to higher probabilities. But by making the coefficient of the logistic regression model a negative one, or sorry, by making the coefficient of the x term negative, so this, this blue line here, uh, right here, so by making it negative, we're actually able to flip the probability, which means that 
values that are less than zero, um, or take the red one or the red line for example. So this is just uh, zero intercept and negative one is a slope. So here, uh, negative x values correspond to higher probability, and positive x values correspond to lower probabilities. So we can flip it. And then the magnitude of the slope term, so we have uh, the, these lines here with five um, as the magnitude. So these lines here all have slope five, a positive five. Um, that causes the curve to more quickly go from the uh, probability uh, near zero to probability uh, near one here. The intercept term interacts with the slope term. So uh, let's first look at the these uh, these curves here where the, the slope is positive. So the, the, the slope is positive. In fact, all of these have a slope of one. So the theta one term is one for all of these. But the curve is shifting to the right. And it's shifting to the right between this, this line here, this line here, and this line here. Here the intercept term is negative two. Here the intercept term is zero. And here the intercept term is two. So by in, by increasing the value of the intercept term with a when we have a positive coefficient term, we're shifting the the sigmoid curve to the left, right? So here is zero by making it go from zero to two. Uh, we're shifting this whole curve here to the left of the of the x axis of the the y axis here. Now, if we invert the slope. So here we'll look at these curves where the, the slope is inverted. So slope is negative one. So this is the negative one intercept zero. When we go to the to the left here, we're actually making the the uh, the constant term smaller. So if we want to go to the right on the inverted, then we make the constant term larger. So you can see by varying the constant and slope terms, we're able to move this probability uh, curve left and right and change how quickly it transitions from zero to one and in which direction that transition happens. Now that we have a basic understanding of the logistic regression model and how the, uh, the coefficients affect the shape of that model, we can now start to talk about the loss. So we saw in our previous lecture that using the squared loss in this setting doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, you could actually apply the squared loss to the logistic regression model, and people have done that historically, but it actually results in, in a loss function that is non-convex. And so it's actually better to use a loss that is more appropriately connected to the probabilistic interpretation of the logistic regression model. And so in the previous lecture, we saw a, a derivation of this, um, but I'm going to write the loss function here. So this is what's called the negative log likelihood, uh, or the cross entropy loss. And it's derived by either writing the, the negative of the log likelihood by treating this, this estimator as the probability of a Bernoulli variable, or the cross entropy loss, which is measuring the Kell divergence between the, the estimated probability distribution uh, that the tumor is uh, malignant or benign, and the observed value of the tumor, which is a, a 0, 1 distribution, uh, indicating whether or not it was uh, malignant or benign. So it doesn't matter how you get to it. The loss, the cross entropy loss, or the negative log likelihood loss are the same, uh, and they're written in the following way for the logistic regression model. So this is the loss function. And now we would like to minimize this loss. And unfortunately, there isn't an analytic solution to minimizing this loss function. Uh, and so instead, we have to turn to iterative methods. And so in the next part, and so in the next video, I'll walk through how we minimize this using uh, SGD and PyTorch. And in the subsequent video, I'll talk about how we minimize this loss using uh, scikit-learn.